uh, connected. <laughs> All right. All right. How's it hey. going, man? Doing well. How about you? Very, very good, man. Let me say, first and foremost, thank you very much for the time today. Uh, I appreciate having you on. I, I'm sorry it's a little bit late here. My, my internet was kind of having some buggy situations, so I had to restart that shit. You know how, how uh, connections nope. go. <laughs> Boys at all. This is my first time going live on Instagram, so this is new to me. Awesome, cool. awesome. Very, very, very cool. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a cool thing and it's a fun opportunity as far as you know yourself being in in either Berlin or Israel. Correct? Are, are you in Berlin? Correct? Berlin, yeah. Berlin. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah, I mean, such a cool opportunity, you know, from us being so many miles away and still having this opportunity. So like I say, thank you for your time. First and foremost today, uh, here on growing on you live, I've got some, some, some questions here for you. And then, uh, we're going to wrap up with a finale that I wrote just for this episode. So if you're ready and you're, you're, you're cozy and all set in, we're gonna get this bad boy rolling. All set in. I'm ready. All right. Awesome. Let, let, let's start from early on as far as, you know, your childhood and early memories with, with, with art and, and your dad being an inspiration, you know, as far as your, your art and, and interest in art. Uh, you've mentioned his work later on with pen and pencil. Are there particular pieces from these later pieces that, you know, maybe you had wished that you kept or things that maybe you did keep that you still cherish today? I think everything that he did, and uh, he and my mom basically still have them, probably laying around the house. But you know what? This is a good idea. If they're not hanging them on their walls, maybe I should take them. Because I grew up around, uh, he wasn't like um, a fully, he didn't occupy the, ma the main part of his time with art. But he, he used to do like very technical drawings of, um, you know, human anatomy he was really great at that, but it was more like uh, studies. Uh, we had a couple of paintings that he did around the house, but they were like more experimental. He later on moved to photography, which took up most of his uh, free time. He's actually an engineer. Uh, he didn't do uh, neither as a full-time profession, so this was just like a very highly skilled hobby. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, his uh, focus shifted uh, towards photography uh, later on, but I really liked those drawings that he did at the around the house. Yeah, wow. Get them. Okay, okay. What, so were there particular early on pieces that kind of inspired you to pick up a pen or crayons or different things like that, that, that you remember kind of digging back a little bit? Yeah, actually, yeah, because when I was a kid, he did murals on my walls. Uh, he did um, like a few Disney characters on my bedroom wall when I was maybe about five or six. And I remember we had like an neighbor uh, in this apartment building where we lived in uh, who was like older than me and he was into uh, my dad's favorite band, which was Pink Floyd. So my dad uh, did a mural of all the characters from the wall, the, the movie, the wall on his uh, bedroom wall. So wow. when getting into into art i also did murals eventually uh during my like high school teen years so i guess that uh, crept down to me quite slowly but eventually i found myself drawing on the walls as well but yeah <laughs> that, okay like a big inspiration regarding um going with uh, an alternative and weird medium uh because i was i was drawing on everything just like, I mean, when I, getting exposed to drawing on walls makes you go, okay, I can just draw on everything. <laughs> okay. Uh, what, what were some of those, those early things that you ended up doing as far as mural-wise? Were, were they images like animals or were they like, uh, you know, uh, uh, pictures of actual people? Uh, you know, what were, what were some of those early uh, pieces from you? I actually uh, did reproductions of uh, heavy metal album covers on my own walls and on friends' walls. They, one, one friend paid me with a t-shirt and another guy paid me with like the equivalent of maybe a nice meal or something. I can't remember. <laughs> but <it> was, <laughs> Nice. So, what album? And probably the, the, the money my dad paid uh, on gas driving me to this uh, friend's place was... <laughs> was bigger than the amount I, w I was getting 
to paint on his walls for so many hours. But uh, yeah, I can't remember. What did I do? I think I, I did like, oh, I can't remember. I did uh, a Led Zeppelin piece. Uh, I think that was on another friend's wall. I did, I think, something out of a Man of War album cover. It's, it was so long ago that I honestly can't remember. But on my own bedroom, uh, my teen years bedroom, I painted the Eddie from Iron Maiden's Killers album. Uh -huh. I painted things from the first few uh, King Diamond album covers. I did some stuff that I picked up from uh, Rob Zombie, a couple of album covers from Lake of Tears, and I can't remember what else. Whoa, man. So right off the bat, I mean, you just jumped right in. It wasn't something as far as having, you know, crayons and, you know, kind of figuring out drawing faces. I mean, you jumped right in as far as doing things like cover art and, and, and uh, you know, different, different forms like that, too. So, wow. That, when I, that, that was only when I got to be like 16 or something. Oh, when I was okay. a kid, it was very, <laughs> it was small steps for sure. Yeah, I can't remember if I was using crayons. I think in Israel we had this like weird version of it, which was called Panda, I think. Which uh, I think on the first day of school, they asked you to bring Panda paint. I can't remember what it was, but I think looking back, it was maybe like a sort of like off-brand local version of crayons could be oh. <laughs> okay. an office in Israel. Oh, okay. okay nice nice all right let, let, let's continue a little bit on you know you mentioned in in other interviews as far as drawing cartoons and and stills for an imaginary night ninja turtles video game uh what can you tell us about maybe some of the cartoons that you were drawing or you know some of these aspects of this video game that you were lining up just a second, this is my first time going live, so I'm geeking out of uh, about uh, having to reply to s stuff that uh, people are writing in here. So thank you, Man Mittens, saying that he loves my work. I always wanted to say that. Thank you. Um, uh, when, yeah, when I was in first or second grade, uh, me and a buddy of mine, Itai, uh, we used to spend the entire time that we were in, in school just uh, ripping out of pages out of our uh, um, notebooks and just drawing. Basically, you could look at it as like still screenshots from an imaginary uh, Ninja Turtles game that never existed. It was basically like if you would pause in the middle of playing like Super Mario or something, it would be like levels and platforms and tons of enemies going up at once. <laughs> maybe, I don't know, hundreds of people. And we would actually meet up later on after school at his place or my place and do the same thing. And I think, I think my mom threw away most of what I did that I kept in our house, but maybe he kept some of his. Oh, I need wow. to talk. Maybe like every day. I know this guy since we were in the seventh, in, when we were like seven years old. So... Dang, wow, okay. Now, now, with... <laughs> okay, okay. With, with being, you know, artistically driven, even at such a young age, can you credit that too a little bit as far as, you know, like, like myself, you know, at, at, at a young age, I was real into music and bands and things. And a lot of that kept me out of trouble. You know, it kept me out of, you know, some of the bullshit that you can fall into as far as, you know, kind of being young and trying to take up time. Is that, that that's kind of the, sounds like the situation as far as you and your friends, like, art was always a really big thing, you know, kind of like a big medium between you guys then, right? Well, I think with the exception of going out and spraying graffiti on stuff, uh, yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> but we, because we didn't have to deal with boredom very much. We would all meet up and just draw. So, yeah, we were living in a very small town, so it was easy for us to maybe go in another direction and find some other stuff that will... Uh, occupy our downtime but yeah i totally credit it to having uh, such a such a big hobby that en encompassed my entire you know my entire day and even i i i go back and i remember being like this pretty dokey geeky kid but i never had problems at school with like i had like violent thugs in my classroom 
but we all got along because they wanted to sit next to me in class and watch me draw on the tables, on the desks. Oh, wow. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something to still have one of those desktops? I think it kept me away from trouble in like more than one way could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay, okay. I, I love that. I mean, that, that's awesome. You know, I mean, I, I want to dig into, you know, kind of moving out a little bit as far as your interest with music, you know, maybe another medium, you know, between your friends and you. And you've mentioned, you know, before with cover art being something, obviously, you know, with an interest in art and that always drawing you uh, initially at a young age. But what were some other alternative routes that you would go as far as discovering bands, you know, maybe even something like show flyers or concert posters or band you know members on the back of the album that have on a t-shirt slayer or something like that what were other routes that you remember finding bands that you weren't familiar with i think basically television uh, which which is odd to think about you know, but there were uh, three main uh, i mean when i got exposed to hard rock and heavy metal it was basically through my dad and through beavis and butthead because <laughs> I was I, I got into uh, the alternative music that was very prominent in MTV during the time I was a big uh, Radiohead fan and uh, the Prodigy fan and my ha my dad hated that stuff, so he gave <laughs> me a uh, of his records uh, which were like uh, that was Deep Purple I think made in Japan, which had nice. a huge and I remember on the back of it it had like a catalog by the record company and in it I saw other uh, album covers and names of other albums by bands that I remember hearing about in Beavis and Butler. I remember like reading those names, Megadeth, Iron Maiden, Metallica. So actually at some point I just went to the record store with like allowance that I saved up and bought a Metallica album, an Iron Maiden album, and a Megadeth album, all based on the album cover. I never heard oh, any of yeah. them. Except for the fact that it was in the same catalog as the guitar music that I, that my dad really got me into with Deep Purple, and the fact that Beavis and Butthead said it was cool. <laughs> I love I love that. I love that. You yeah. Know, and, and later on, oh, sorry. And la later on, um, when we discovered that that there's a, a, a name for this genre, uh, heavy metal. We, I mean, me and my friends used to watch, wait uh, until like two, two in the, in the morning uh, to see a couple of shows that were on MTV on and on uh, VH1. The MTV one was called Super Rock. I think it was on like Mondays. And this is how we discovered bands like Fear Factory or Machine Head or Pantera. Oh, yeah. No, well, maybe Pantera was another band that we discovered for Beers and Butthead. But also we used to watch um, Tommy Vance's Friday Rock Show on uh, Fridays from VH1. And we discovered tons of bands for that show. <laughs> nice. nice. I, you know, I, tons of thrash metal stuff and extreme metal stuff as well. We even saw like a Bosom video once. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 for sure. You know, and it's one thing with nowadays even, I think... I can still credit to, because for the longest time myself, cover art was always a thing, you know, but I can even say more recently, it's a little bit more difficult with streaming and kind of, you know, trying to, you know, find different things off of that. But more recently, and it's ironic that you did the piece was the three, 3000 AD cover uh, for, for the boy, you know, we're going to dig into that a little bit later, but seeing that I was like, holy shit. I don't know anything about this band and I have to check this out. <laughs> so, I mean, it's cool. <laughs> What's that? Did you like it? I love that record. I love it. It is so sick. I, I, I was instantly hooked from that. I didn't know anything because I think they have like an album or two before, before that. Um, but yeah. I didn't know them before that. And then seeing that, I was like, holy shit. I am very much into this band. Awesome. That, that, I'm happy that uh, it managed to, um, you know, bring some new listeners to this band because they're a new band and they're, pretty unknown so it, it's great to hear that some some people just check them out just because of the cover art. that's great yeah totally, it, totally the reason i uh, you know i feel very um secure in knowing that i contribute something that i feel proud about because i mean being part of records helping out bands it's not like i'm doing it 
fully in order to you know, give back to the community or something. But I truly be- believe that uh, when I uh, when I'm commissioned to do my job, I contribute something that I fully believe in and support. Yeah, totally. You know, and it, it, it's funny too in like talking with different people involved with record labels or some, you know, someone who, who contributes artwork or different things like that. It's always cool to see too, as far as like a recognition of sorts where it's like, I was never all that much into playing music or maybe I wasn't even good at guitar, but you know, I love this band and, you know, I just kind of did like mock cover albums and they saw it and loved it, you know, or it was like, I just decided to make a label and, you know, I can contribute to the, the, to the, the, the music community in that sense too. So, I mean, that's always cool too, to see, you know, as far as not giving up in a sense of like, well, I can't play drums, so I can't be incorporated with it. You know, like it's just as important. And I mean, in a sense, even more so for sure. Yeah. Which is, which is very cool about metal because sometimes you work with like record companies and you get to a point where you talk to uh, maybe the accountant who's in charge of, uh, handling invoices and he starts talking to you about heavy metal because he's a fan as well. I think this is something yeah. that's really unique to this subgenre. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah for sure. <laughs> Let, let's bring it back. What's that? I'm sorry. I just I just added that even the the professionals are fans. Yeah. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. What I wanted to bring it back to as far as your you know uh, as far as where did your art you know initially being like a hobby and an interest and a passion where did that go as far as the transition into you know possibly being a career opportunity where did it, where did that first come up i have no idea because uh, to be honest with you uh, <laughs> i think a large part of it has to do with being a little bit um juvenile in a way so there was never a major like a a major plan like looking ahead could this be a career? Could this be something that's sustainable? Could I raise a family uh, doing this full time or whatever? I just kept on, you know, waking up each and every day doing the same thing I was doing in any way ever since I was a kid. So I attribute a lot of it to being so juvenile and childish that I just kept on persisting until at some point it just became a career <laughs> by by pure persistence, oh, wow. I guess. I, I can wow. right. no idea. Yeah, sure. I mean, but having the passion of it and, you know, having it be something where you have the integrity behind doing it because it's something that you love and then pan it out. I mean, that's a beautiful, uh, that's a beautiful answer in and of itself. Shit. <laughs> because it's what um, does just, I don't know. I had a, a couple of jobs which were day jobs for me, and I would actually uh, return home like late at night and do album covers, like in, in, instead of doing anything else. So at some point, it was uh, I, I don't know. I used to work in an advertisement uh, company, and at some point, I just I was so unhappy doing it that I um, rented an apartment and quit my job, which uh, forced me to make doing album covers a career because now I had to pay pay bills for the next like year that I had the lease on myself. So that okay. was the move that uh, changed yeah. things up the way that I forced myself to make it into something sustainable. Okay, okay. Now, th- this is something that kind of came to mind. It wasn't necessarily anything I, I prepped or, you know, had, had sent, you know, beforehand. But now with some of your artwork being... Or, uh, you know, some of the some of the times I've heard, you know, kind of in your interviews, you mentioned that you look into the lyrics and you look into some of the content that's being, you know, presented before ever being commissioned. Did you have albums that you were just a fan of that you would look into, you know, some of the lyrics or some of the content and be, you know, like make kind of like a mock cover album of your own, you know, like different things that you had? No, to be honest with you, no, because once... I had an, another album uh, once I was listening to an album and it had the cover even if I didn't like it it was part of the history of me of me you know finding out about this band finding out about this uh, album tracking it down buying it whatever opening the the plastic crap and everything so it was weird to me to think oh I, I just don't like this album Redo cover something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. it was part of the the entire ritual of it even if i i never thought it to myself well i, I could that's 
it will uh, it will permit to think in this way. But uh, when I'm presented with with an album which doesn't have an album cover yet, then it's really important to you to be able to basically give the band something that differentiates them from everybody else. Because if I would just do my thing, the same thing to each and every band that I work with, it would just make no sense. I mean, take for instance, uh, I did a very successful al album cover. I mean, successful in terms of the fans appreciation of it. Uh, to a band like My Dying Bride. And on the other hand, I did the same thing for a band, for a band like Halloween. And both of them were really uh, well received by the fans. But if you would s switch them and put this band's logo on that album cover and that band's logo on this album cover, everybody would go, huh? This sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Out of context, would lose everything because it needs to be uh, connected to the actual music. I love that. I love that. Nice. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Good answer. I, I, I love that. It was just something that kind of, you know, popped in my head where I thought like, oh, maybe, you know, I, I, there was different things like that earlier on, but uh, you know, uh, uh, so kind of touching on maybe even like the first time being commissioned for something, uh, whether it was solitary's uh, trail of omission or before bring us back to the first time being commissioned for a piece and, you know, uh, not necessarily even to put it out there in like a negative way, but if it was a positive experience, uh, if you, you know, it, was it like a fun project and maybe what were some things that you had learned um, that were a learning process working on that first piece? To be honest with you, this was so, such a long time ago, could, I think maybe 2000. Uh, you can even go to Metal Archives and give me like a, a more accurate uh, answer because I can't even remember when. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I can't be trusted with giving you very accurate information about even what the album cover was about, the first solitary album cover, I have no idea what it's even about. It's been so long ago that my uh, memory is slowly deteriorating and every day I keep forgetting. <laughs> get more and more stuff more recently. But I can, for sure, when I try to think about that album cover for solitary, I can see that I was very much influenced by a very contemporary album cover artists like Travis Smith and Dave McKean. Mm. I think it's apparent when you look at that album cover. And I remember being so, so excited about getting the actual album and holding it in, in my hands because this was the first time and it was just, you know, I was, a, I grew up with CDs, so I was a CD collector. So when I got the CD, it was just something. I, I remember the scene very vividly. I met these guys afterwards outside of like a concert. I think Amona Mouth was playing or something. And uh, I met them like, in a parking lot and they brought me uh, like, a, uh, like a CD from their car. And I was just walking around with the, the, the CD showing it to all of my friends. And <laughs> <laughs> I remember it was a trial by fire uh, when it ca came to the technical aspect of it because I've never heard about stuff like bleed. Do you know what bleed is when you're preparing stuff for print? Okay, yeah. You yep. know, it had like a bit more of the artwork on the edges. So when you cut them up, uh, you don't get like um, white stripes at the end. Right. So I had no idea about to really learn everything on the spot because it was, uh, I never um, like went to school and, or got like any form of formal education when it came to graphic design. So I had to learn everything and fly, which was oh, a fun okay. experience. Okay. Allow <laughs> yourself to do it when you're, you know, when this is your first album, this is a, a young band and you're, we were all teenagers basically. Me and the band. <laughs> okay. Does anything come to mind as far as a band approaching you that you may have not been familiar with and, you know, was asking, asking for a piece and maybe even something after, you know, you grew to know the album that was presented, you, you know, it's a band that you still love today? Hmm. Yeah. 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 Ton, tons of them. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think about specific bands, but, uh, Hmm, that's a good question. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you on this one because I, 
I'm so I'm so bad with my memory, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not a problem, not a problem. My, my next question, I was going to ask about your exhibits, um, you know, just earlier times with that and kind of maybe some of the things that, that served as on-the-job training for the first times that you, you had done an exhibit and, uh, you know, what you've kind of taken from those earlier times to newer shows and uh, what was your first, was the first in, was it 2017, the Bloodstock? No, um, my first exhibition, I had a couple of exhibitions prior. I had an exhibition in a small festival in Holland called Brainstorm Festival, which is also like an indoors um, heavy metal festival which spans like over two days, I, I think. And second, the second exhibition I had was at a film festival in, uh, in Romania, in Transylvania. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Each and every one of them, yeah, was like a learning curve because you, this, this, I mean, first exhibition I had, I came without any prints or anything like to sell. And I, actually, I never even thought about selling the stuff that I hung on the walls. So people were coming to me and say, how much for this one? And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> and then I had to, to figure out <laughs> selling this stuff. I was so happy to be invited to an exhibition. And so only on my third exhibition, I, I started bringing prints because people were asking to to get these uh, these pieces for themselves to hang on their walls as well. Mm. But so you get with everything, you get better with experience. You learn by mistakes, for sure. I think um, I can't remember what, but uh, but having like the Bloodstock exhibition, doing this one before I did. Um, Copenhagen before I did Wacken was great because there was no pressure. When I did the Bloodstock exhibition, it's, it was basically like only four pieces in a group exhibition. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very low stress and very, very relaxed. So it was oh, very okay. easy. <laughs> Doing like a solo exhibition in Wacken a couple of years ago, which was like, it was me basically up on my feet the entire day because we had... Um, like the entire space uh, to ourselves and we had a merchandise table and we i we i had tons of uh, bands that i've worked with that came along to because we i rarely get to see the guys that i work with because most of the time we just communicate through emails so it was way more intense and way more work but it was way fun as well oh okay all right now with with your with your exhibits and you kind of mentioned it as far as like selling prints and things do you typically sell a lot of the original pieces like do you have them the originals that are on the wall do those go up for sale too or is that something that you kind of wait a while until you let those go no it's funny uh, when it comes to to my album covers they are all drawn digitally so there there are no actual uh, originals to to, to have and uh, I damn really worked, yeah, I worked on this technique for the last like 10 years or so managing uh, to get to a point where it, they were basically indistinguishable than if I would paint them uh, on canvas or paper uh, which allows me to be more flexible uh, be able to uh, do this full time instead of uh, having to rely on uh, playing the gallery game or whatever. But on the other hand, it has its shortcomings, like not having uh, a master copy. But, uh, but it's funny. I, I sometimes see people uh, using my work online in order to headbutt digital art. They're like, yeah, at last, some real oil paintings, not like all this digital crap that everybody is doing. <laughs> When it, when it comes to the technique, it's very similar if you follow, um, if you follow the same uh, principles because you start off thinking about the composition, then basic shapes, broad strokes, going deeper and deeper uh, with uh, tinier digital brushes. But, you know, the main difference is... Uh, Again, not having a master copy and not waiting for uh, paint to dry or mixing your own paints. Wow, <laughs> no kid. I mean, mm. I didn't even know that. I had, I had no idea. And not to say that that takes away, because I mean, it's still insanely talented stuff. But 
you know, just the amount of detail that's in this shit, you know, I mean, it looks like it's some sort of a print pulled off of, you know, a, a live canvas. So even more so, bravo. Holy moly. <laughs> that is insane. I didn't know that. I mean, I never wanted to, the the medium to be, I mean, not even the medium, everything that uh, I put into uh, a piece, I don't want it to uh, be distracting of um, of what on of the main focal point of the of the piece of what I wanted to bring to the forefront. I can't remember where I heard this uh, quote, but somebody said to me that you should deduct as much as you can from a piece until it's still works and you can deduct more stuff from it instead of like adding more and more stuff to it and it goes through and i mean and i apply it to everything like the medium itself uh i i like the fact that when you look at it you don't really know how it's made of which is something that really bothers me when you look at like all the very early uh, 3D modeling stuff. When you think about 3D art from the 90s, mm. you can look at it and I mean, the medium immediately jumps at you. Like, okay, I remember when 3D programs were this bad. You actually think about the program. When you think about uh, what was that album? Dance of Death by Iron Maiden. You think oh, about yeah. the actual they made it with. It was called Poser, which is amazing, amazing coincidence. But uh, yeah, I, I never, thought, I never wanted some somebody to look at it and think, oh, it's cool for a for a pencil drawing. It's cool for a digital piece. It's cool for a, fo a photo. And even when I did some album covers which used photography, it was never like straight up photography. Uh, it was always mixed media with other stuff as well. Wow. I, I mean, I guess the first thing that comes to mind too, because it's not to you know discredit as far as it being like a real painting, but you take something like in film as far as CGI as opposed to practical effects. When you have something, yeah. you know, that they use CGI, for instance, or digital, you know, like uh, a digital medium, you know, and it's done well, that's where, you know, it's like, oh my God, that's crazy. I can't believe that that, you know, isn't actually a physical thing that someone is touching, you know? And I think that almost makes me want to go back and look at all of your stuff again. Cause I'm like, I still, I can't believe, you know, I mean, even, you know, back here with the hate breed album, you know, looking at that, I'm just like, God, I can't, you know, it's, it's absolutely insane. And I think it's a little bit more even of an appreciation of like, you know, the, the fine tuning that it must have gone. Was it the same type of programs that you're using over time? And did you end up, you know, uh, developing some sort of tools yourself that were, that were things custom to, to your work? Yeah. I, uh, at some point, Not to I, dig in too much. I don't want you to have to give up everything. <laughs> <laughs> at some point I scanned a few of my own uh, brush strokes that I did with acrylics and then programmed my own, uh, um, digital brushes in Photoshop, but to be honest with you, I use such a, a minimalistic setup and I strive to get my setup to be as minimalistic as possible. Uh, like a year ago, I, I bought a new laptop uh, that has uh, like a touch screen on it, which basically, um, which is basically a tablet. So you can paint, like draw directly on the, um, on the laptop. So right now, all I need to do in order to keep on doing my work, I just need the proper space in a desk and to have my laptop and pen, and that's about it, which is very liberating because when I started up, uh, I couldn't go uh, uh, without having like this, you know, you remember the old computer monitors and how much they weighed and, uh, and having like a huge desktop computer as well, which I still have, but... Again, it's it's so liberating to not uh, be so dependent on hardware and software because sometimes I even you know buy stock brushes from I, I even use some stock brushes from Adobe, which uh, no no endorsement here. Mainly not about the the tools that you use, but about. Uh, keeping the principles because I know a lot of uh, I've seen a lot of. Uh, 
artists who are disciplined with uh, traditional mediums and then they switch to uh, digital work. And then there's like this very tempting, um, it's very a tempting opportunity to do stuff quickly and skip over uh, practices that you would normally do when uh, approaching a piece of art. Let, let's say, for instance, you, um, you take reference photos of models okay. in your art. Okay. If you don't, if you just put them up on, on Photoshop and start playing around with them and put like this over here and switch it up and rotate it and whatever, you screw up the lighting direction. And you would never do that when you would paint on canvas. You would say in advance, okay, the light comes from the left side. So all of my uh, elements are going to have highlights on this side and shadows on this side, etc. But if you're working uh, with digital means, it's sometimes tempting to just play with stuff and change things all over, which would result in you uh, skipping over... Um, keeping cohesion when it comes to fundamentals like light directions, um, perspective, etc., which I'm in no way, shape, or form a big expert on. I still have tons of errors when it, com when it comes to anatomy and perspective and whatever, but at least I try to, <laughs> to do it right. So it yeah, wow. looks like painted in a, in an, a traditional medium. Wow, man, that that is that is insane. Uh, yeah, I, I I mean, it, like I like I say, it's already so so cool, and uh, you know, I, I, knowing that, I mean, I, I guess I've listened to a lot of interviews and different things. I'd never heard that. So, <laughs> is my next question? I was going to ask about different tools that you use and brushes, and maybe things outside of their original purpose. But uh, this is kind of a, a whole different uh, different approach that I was not expecting. So <laughs> but hearing, you know, some of the things about, you know, some of the tools that you use and trying to keep it simple and the approach uh, as far as, you know, the foundation, the basics, you know, I mean, that that, that is awesome, man. That, that's amazing. You know, I, 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 I would, uh, uh, is there other times, you know, where you're so into a piece that maybe you had plans and, you know, you might be sitting there at dinner and you have your, you know, you have something kind of just a low, just below the table there where you're trying to, just finish off the idea or is that more so you just keep everything at home? Mm. Uh, the, the line is so blurry between walk and I, I, don't, even, <laughs> okay. I don't even know how to, how to uh, give this uh, like a title the rest of the time that I'm not walking. I think, uh, if there's uh, like something that I find in common with uh, each with like artists in general is a way to uh, make the best of a bad situation. As I yes. said earlier, very childish allowed me to keep on plowing ahead and making it a career by accident, mm -hmm. but also being like obsessive and having tunnel vision and being really like having your world revolves around it, like one tiny aspect of of life probably hurt me in tons of ways I, i'm probably a horrible listener I'm, ba I'm probably a horrible friend as well but i think it probably made the artwork better because sometimes yeah a person can look at me and and talk for a while and i'm like wow i haven't listened to anything he did that guy said <laughs> in about the concept I had uh, earlier today of the art artwork that I'm supposed to paint later on today. So yeah, at least at the end of the day, I get to do something that I know brings other people joy. So maybe it balances uh, the suckiness that I suffer, <laughs> that I <Yeah>. suffer <laughs> in person yeah. life yeah. as a result. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I think there there is that balance too, but... I guess in comparing that to like a musician, for instance, and being out on the road and, you know, there's kind of those balances, you know, where you have kind of your, your push or your hustle, your stride, you know, where you have different things that sacrifices come along and, uh, but, you know, making positive out of the negative and trying to, you know, do what you can to, to make a good thing out of uh, you know, possibly a bad situation. That's always good. That's always a good, you know, uh, a thought in this even with this last year year and a half here with this pandemic and things being shut down you know having that mentality i think helps a lot with 
you know, pushing through some of the things that, uh, you know, some of the hardships that people are going through. So, um, yeah, cool. I, I can definitely appreciate that for sure. Uh, wrapping up here, I, I, I wanted to ask about three of your pieces from over the years, just as far as maybe initial ideas of how they came about, um, you know, maybe even as far as like the process of working with the band and, and uh, you know, how it came from the first draft to what the what the fans ended up getting at the uh you know as the final piece uh and first i wanted to ask about as mentioned earlier the 3000 ad the boyd cover uh what can you tell us about that bad boy you know what what uh what comes to mind as far as working on that this actually connects to one of your previous questions about uh, discovering bands that i didn't know about I, i've never heard about 3000 ad beforehand but uh oh, it was very okay. the album and I actually, it's so rewarding to, at the end of the day, be part of, of you know, the support crew on a record that you end up listening to, like, for fun. Yeah. Which yeah. Now, that think, what, now that I think about it, yeah, I knew tons of these bands, but a lot of the albums I was part of, like the album I did with Atheist, Jupiter, the album I did with Anacruzis, the album I did with Ken Nardi, those have became... Uh, some of my all-time favorite uh, records, and I play them often. Just oh, uh, wow. last week, I was listening just for fun for to a band from Israel called Pray for Nothing. I did their last album oh, cover. Yeah, okay. Great record, and I, I mean, I know these guys, so I would uh, pretty much uh, end up listening to this record in any way. But yeah, it's it's amazing to find out cool new bands and get involved and be part of something that you love. Uh, when, when it came to the 3000 AD album, their uh, vision for it was um, based around this utopian future in which everything is being broadcasted and absorbed by everybody. Basically, like everybody's being uh, connected to um, to school, uh, throughout the entire day and just everybody being like we are right now, just everybody be, like kind of like a sci-fi ma matrix kind of thing. Okay. So I was thinking about, I always start up with, um, with uh, an exercise in which I try to think about a very concise and simple metaphor, allegory to what the lyrics are about, the main theme of the lyrics. So I, try to think about something very iconic and um, memorable that will convey this idea of everybody being in a place where everybody's transmitting the entire day. So I thought, well, maybe I will build like a landscape, a cityscape, which is built around the idea of uh, buildings not being used to house people, as their main function, but in order to be places that uh, emit this data, this data. So I oh. thought about, oh, let's try to think about, okay, it will be quite corny to like do a city landscape where each and every building is built by, you know, tons of televisions, there are tons of album covers like this from the 80s. And I didn't want to have like very like, modern contemporary technologies. I didn't want to build skyscrapers made out of cell phones or whatever. So I thought, okay, this needs to be something a little bit like an allegory inside the allegory. So I thought about the eye of uh, an insect, the eye of, uh, of a fly, which has <laughs> like maybe chapters in it. So if you look at that album cover, basically those are, sit are like uh, buildings shaped like the eyes of fly, which are <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. thousands of, of tiny places. And then man. I added like a chip in order to give it a sense of scale as well. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that is so, so, and you know, the whole idea, like as far as like the sci-fi, even not, you know, looking too, too close at it, you know, that's kind of the idea and kind of the unease of like, what the hell is going on here, you know, and kind of digging into some of the content of the album too. But uh, man, what a cool story. That That's awesome. And the, the fly eye, I totally see that now that you say that too. That's, and creepy, you know, in its own way. <laughs> 
looks like uh, It looks like tons of other stuff. I mean, when you think about stuff that has t- tons of tiny receptors, it can look like a microphone as well. But the fly eye was the main inspiration. And yeah, I think when it okay. came to the, the visual representation of it, uh, there's a lot of influence by the Polish artist Bekszynski, which is... Uh, I mean, whenever I do something that is directly influenced by a visual artist, I try and make sure I... Give proper credit where credit is due. So, okay. yeah, uh, I think on this one, is, it's very clear, but in case somebody sees it and is not aware of Bekszynski yet, very much check him out. Okay. For sure. nice. nice. I love that. I love that. Next up, I wanted to dig into Hangman. You have the Artisan cover. And that, uh, I mean, truly is a haunting image you know even aside from it being a cover art or different things something that draws you or myself at least uh back time and time again tell us tell us about that bad boy thank you um this is one of my personal favorites as well because i mean uh, a lot of the stuff i tend to gravitate more towards tends to be uh, uh, stuff that's like more storytelling based um uh, Uh, this is why this is why i uh I never think about the stuff I do as like neoclassical or fantasy or whatever because if I use like neoclassical elements like um like having uh people dressed up in robes or whatever, this is because I don't want to date the artwork and give it like a specific period of time because oh, if okay. you if you if I give up any information. Which is not necessary for the story to come across, then I take away a little bit of the focus from it, and I just love it when when things are more like in folklore or in fairy tales in fairy tales you usually uh li- you usually hear about you know this kid uh lived in a village and he went to whatever and he met this uh, animal or whatever they never speak about. In which country did it happen in which part of the world in which era of humanity could it be like two hundred years ago or maybe mm-hmm. two two years ago so I try to deduct from each and every um piece anything that I don't think is so crucial for the story to come across and hangman I think the inspiration for it came i i I think I read somewhere about uh premature burial. Well, uh, sometimes uh, people would be buried uh, before they died and, so, and people would find out about it later on because they dug up the graves for some reason and then they found like scratch marks inside the graves. So afterwards, uh, there was a, a time period where people started uh, having, I can't remember where in the world, but some graves had like a mechanism inside connected to a bell outside. So if the person which wasn't dead inside the <laughs> wake up, find out that he's six feet under, buried, it will just ring the bell and uh, the people upstairs would know that they buried somebody alive. Oh so my that God. About, wow, this is cool. Maybe like him pulling on this uh, bell would actually make like a melody. And then it's like, wow. Then I thought, <laughs> the most absurd thing to... create this like weird character that would use uh, death as a way to uh, create melody with bells. So this is how I uh, came to a point where I thought about, okay, how do you uh, make dead people create melodies? And then I thought, okay, you will hang them up on rope or whatever because you can't see how they are hanged up. And when they are trying to gasp for their last breath, they would... squirm and uh, move around making these bells move and create this symphony for the guy oh my lord wow that i that's even more haunting than the images <laughs> Jeez. wow because i i think um, i was never like a guy who writes stuff i was never as you can see when i'm trying to to describe it to you I get a little bit uh, clumsy and I say, I mean, I talk too much about something that could be pretty much very much more concise than it, than it is. So creating 
this story as a piece of art is, I think, the best representation I could give. Because, yeah, as a storyteller, uh, it, it won't work for me, specifically. Yeah, yeah. wow. That's, that's insane. L- last up, I wanted to ask about, and this was the piece that I used uh, for, our, for our flyer here, the Despise Icon Purgatory cover art. Uh, what can you tell us about that bad boy? That awesome album. Thank you. I, I love the album as well, music-wise. And uh, I think they got in touch with me because uh, they were working with the usual artist and uh, something didn't work for some reason. And they needed something relatively quickly. And then I said, no, I'm just, I can't do it. And then I said, man. Maybe let's try to find a way to work together. And then I said, okay, let's, let's see if we can, just by talking through emails, we can uh, already come up together with a concept, which will be very simplest, very like simple and direct, which will save us weeks on me going through the lyrics, thinking about different ideas, going back and forth between trying different stuff. And then if we know that in a matter of days, we can come up with the final concept, then I know that I can uh, maybe do it in a more limited time frame than, I, than what I usually take on. And then the lead singer said something about him having an idea about an angel uh, that is stuck in a situation where he's in pain and suffering. So, uh, I mean, the cliche heavy metal album cover route would be to have like this angel doing like, you know, one of those poses mm-hmm. and being uh, very, I don't know, um, being pulled by imaginary forces or whatever. And then I thought, okay, it, we have an angel. Uh, we have to have like a human character. And he has to have wind. That's the minimum. That's what we gotta have let's find a way to come up with an allegory that uses take advantage of these wings and make it into the thing that brings him pain because this is what separates this angel from just normal character so i thought okay let's say the wings would be made out of gold which sounds great i mean i'm an angel with golden wings maybe that's that was his wish maybe that uh, symbolizes his uh, aspirations or maybe his greed, whatever. Maybe it's like an, an Icarus type of allegory. It's super mm-hmm. open to interpretation so everybody can um, connect to it in their own uh, personal way. But the main part of it was like golden wind sounds fun until you have to try to, di- to live with them and then they break <laughs> his and hurt him very much which is why he's in pain and that's it. In pain. Job done. Damn. But yeah, I was, I was really happy about uh, when I came up with that idea, and it connected quite quickly. And I and I wrote this to the to the lead singer of the band uh, in like a couple of days afterwards in an email, and we knew right away that we we all we already have everything set up, and we just need to execute it. Wow. That's, I mean, that's awesome too. And especially for something like that, still, once again, with the detail and everything, I mean, that being a little bit more of a, uh, not rushed situation, but something that was a little bit more time limited uh, and still busting something out like that, you know, that, that, that's awesome. That's really, really cool. I, I, and I love, I think too, that's one thing as well as with, with your stuff, you mentioned and kind of leaving it up to interpretation and uh, you know, it wasn't so much my idea on asking these things, but more so like kind of the backstories and how certain things came about because uh, there's definitely things like the Thy Art is Murder cover art that you had where, you know, I had a certain interpretation and then, you know, kind of looking at things. And I think it was maybe even an interview, either yourself or somebody else mentioned, you know, as far as like fattening up the lamb for a for a, a meal later on. You know, I was like, oh. holy shit, that is sick. <laughs> it's, it's completely awesome. So I, I love hearing that stuff. This is one of the instances when I didn't want it to be open to interpretations, but I think it's hard to uh, keep people from thinking sexual stuff. Yeah. Oh. So, <laughs> yeah. so this is why uh, when I do stuff that has like sexual connotations, maybe the storytelling uh, works better because your first initial uh, reaction uh, to it could be to think about uh, the sexual angle of it. Oh, man. Well... <laughs> Uh, 
a piece of my whole life ceremony works because yeah oh yeah that's he's totally sucking on that titty yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no there's no way of looking at it and is this what I think it is no no yeah. that's <laughs> so it, it, it's hard to I mean I was uh, growing up I was really uh, influenced by a comic book I mean not really comic books there was one very famous uh, mainstream uh, comic book in Israel called Zbang which was the only comic book I, I read during that time but I was also very much into caricatures and In caricatures, you would need to tell the entire joke, including the punchline, uh, in a single frame, which is what I'm trying to squeeze into an album cover as well. Yes, I love that. I love that. Great. I mean, great point. That, that, that is awesome. You know, and I think that was certainly one of the ones where, you know, it kind of struck looking over and over and then, you know, I, I mean, probably years after, you know, where I had ended up hearing, you know, you, you doing the interview or however it came about and hearing that. And I was like, wow, I think initially I wasn't thinking so much sexually, but as a thing of like maybe a good and evil and, you know, evil trying to lure in, you know, the, the, the good by prey of like a meal or something. Meanwhile, it's, you know, hiding right behind it about to kill it too, you know? So, uh, but okay, I, I mean, it, been- it's absolutely no. incredible. Okay, so you, so you got the, the main part of it. Okay, so I wasn't more. Yeah, because right. some of the comments online were going in a direction. Maybe people were trying, were trying to be funny, but maybe it wasn't uh, clear enough. Yeah, for sure. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, no. I, I mean, either way, very striking and something, you know, I, I appreciate hearing, you know, all of these things and you sharing all of these things too. Uh, you know, absolutely, you know, cool. And, 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 you know, this wraps everything, you know, that, that I have written for our interview. Um, I do have one finale, but this is your opportunity as far as if you want to, you know, let everybody know where some of your stuff is, or if you have uh, your, your merch or your, uh, your, your prints available online. And maybe even if you have something coming up here that you want to let everybody know, this is your opportunity, man. We are now on Instagram. So just I mean, go to the Instagram page. It has everything. Okay. Don't worry awesome. yourself with other yeah. data. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Let, so let me ask you as far as for the finale here and kind of digging into some, some, some things as far as my, you know, my, my research a little bit further on your work. If you had the opportunity where, let's say, a, there was a comic book. I know that you had mentioned that. And you've mentioned, you know, some comics, uh, you know, early on. If there was a comic book or, say, even a, 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 a movie that was about to be coming out, that was a director that you loved, who would be somebody that you would love to work on in a different medium as far as doing the cover art or maybe even illustrating a comic book? What, what type of characters would you like to do or who would be a director for a film that you would love to do the poster art for? This is funny. I was just talking about with my friends a, a couple of uh, weeks ago. I'm such a movie buff. I don't have any favorite directors. This is, oh, like, okay. this is a whole a uh, um, blog, right? This is a horror-based po- podcast, right? Yeah, that, that so, mu- musicians and, yeah. Yeah, so even growing up, I was so passive in my way of uh, getting exposed to movies. I was basically watching whatever there was on, on cable TV and some stuff that maybe my friends got, got into, which is why I, I only, you know, I only watched Alien, like, last year. I still haven't oh, watched, wow. like, I still haven't watched, I, I, the only reason I saw, like, The Evil Dead, it was just because it was on TV, but I haven't watched, like, no Hitchcock movies. I've never seen uh, Halloween. I've never uh, seen Halloween. Halloween. I've never seen Friday. <laughs> I... I mean, when it comes to horror movies, I'm really bad. For some odd reason, I, I saw a Serbian film, but that's something else. Um, oh. When it comes to horror films, yeah, I'm just a completely, a total noob when it comes to, to film and cinema in general. So I've got no good idea for, good answer for you. I was only, even when it comes to uh, visual art, I can hold up a conversation about Salvador Dali for maybe 10 minutes be- before I start talking about how he was good friends with Alice Cooper. And then I would start blabbing on about Alice Cooper for like two hours because I was <laughs> okay. music nerd, 
was the big music buff, which was always my main focus, always my main passion. And I and seriously, I could never think about a better medium that I feel connected to than working on albums. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, let me let me let me adjust this a little bit then. If you had the opportunity to work with a band that had an album, they were wanting to do art pieces for every song. So it's an album that you love, one of your favorites ever, and they wanted you to do an art piece for every track. What album would you love to do a visual for every track on the album? Ooh, uh, I guess I would have to go with nostalgia. I would have to uh, go with something that was maybe um, a very formative album for my youth. Probably Iron Maiden, Metallica, Megadeth, each and every one of those. But oh, to be yeah. honest with you, I'm way more interested in doing a new Iron Maiden album cover or a new Metallica album cover. Oh, yeah. These are the opportunities to create new, you know, folklore, new lore for, um, for new music. And it's like a losing battle trying to go against nostalgia. <laughs> Which is why I don't, I get sometimes offers to uh, do reissues, you know, um, create a new album cover for uh, an old album that for some reason they want to change the album cover to. And in many ways, even if it's uh, technically um, superior to the old album cover, it's so hard to fight nostalgia, which is sure. why I try to focus on, on new music. Especially in, in cases like Metallica and Iron Maiden, where fans have been so eager to get uh, some, of those, some of those classic images that will get them so excited like they were uh, during the heyday of these bands. Yeah, like I was. Okay, okay. A Metallica album cover, I just went out and bought the record. Thing. It was Master of Puppets, Killers, and Megadeth. Either euthanasia or rest in peace, can't remember. But those album covers were like, it was so clear to me that with those album covers, the music has to be good. And it did. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I, I mean, I appreciate that just as much, too. You know, those are, uh, you know, kind of things I just try to take off the, off the top of the head and maybe throw at your way and, and see where, where it goes. But, um, you know, this, this has been absolutely amazing, man. And I really appreciate the time. I appreciate, you know, you coming on today and, uh, you know, taking the time out of your day. You know, I, I really appreciate all you, you do. And, you know, uh, please continue because uh, fans are absolutely loving this stuff, uh, myself included. So I, I appreciate Thanks. the stuff that you're doing and uh, keep up the good work, my man. Thank you for inviting me. My, my pleasure. Yeah. I'm sorry for not giving you a straight answer to like 50% of your questions. But I <laughs> That's not, not a problem, not a problem. Yeah, no, this has been awesome. Like I say, thank you very much. And uh, you, uh, you, you take care and stay healthy, my man. You too, Eric. Yep, all right. See ya. All the best, man. He's a lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, he's kind of a guy, but he is so lo-fi, lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, baby, baby. Lo-Fi Horror Guy has been recorded in front of a live studio audience.